chapter 13 and also chapter 14. This is Numbers 13 and will also be in chapter 14 today, 13 and 14. And uh, we'll give you just a moment to find that in your Bible and then we'll take a moment to pray together. Numbers 13. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful we can pause at this point in the service and ask for your mercies and blessing on the preaching of your word. The preaching, the public declaration of the truth about you and your word is something you designed. And it was something you've commissioned prophets and pastor teachers to do. And so we're believing you that you're going to accomplish spiritual good through these God-ordained means, even in these next minutes. Lord, we ask for the freedom of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that he would bring us into all truth and show us Jesus Christ. And Lord, for those who are apart from him, that they would be drawn. And Lord, for those Christians who struggle, who need hope and encouragement, who need a a boost of faith, we pray you'd grant it to them today. Accomplish your will. Thank you for the teachers with our children. Bless their class as well. Thank you for their ministry. We commit this next hour into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're in Numbers chapter 13. The title of the message today is, When Faith Gives Way. When Faith Gives Way. The Gulf states are now on high alert again as we've entered another hurricane season. Recent storms in recent decades like Hurricane Harvey that hit Houston and Hurricane Katrina that hit New Orleans have reminded us that these Storms can cause billions of dollars of damage and lead to the loss of hundreds of lives. I'm thinking especially right now of Hurricane Katrina that hit uh, in August of 2005, hit the city of New Orleans and nearly buried it under a bundle of water. Its wind speeds over eastern Louisiana were clocked at 125 miles per hour. The breadth of the storm reached 120 miles wide. But the Category 3 storm did more damage than anybody anticipated because of the failure of the levee system and the water channels that surrounded the city of New Orleans. The stormwater surge overwhelmed the levees and led to catastrophic failure, causing 80% of the city to be underwater as well as many of the surrounding parishes that suffered. Many people, you recall, left and never returned. And those that did return, returned to houses that were no longer inhabitable. So in the hour of need, the levees gave way, crippling the city, and leading to more than 1,800 fatalities, according to Wikipedia. Now, I started here today not to give you a lesson on meteorology or storm weather, but rather to set the stage for a lesson on faith. It's when the levees gave way that the city drowned in water. And so it is in the Christian faith. When faith designed to hold you up in the storm gives way. We're following the journey of Moses and Israel through the wilderness, And what a ride it has been. It has taken us really through the depths of the Red Sea and all the way up to the heights of Mount Sinai. And each step of the way, God has shown Himself faithful and good and gracious to His people. Now, the nation stands at a new crossroads. They're actually standing at Kadesh Barnea, which should be on the screen next, which is very much south of Jerusalem and Hebron, and even what's technically the southernmost city in Israel is Beersheba. 
Kadesh Barnea, though, was at the south, at the Negev, at the borders of the promised land. And there they have an opportunity to claim the land that God had promised to them. Only 16 months has transpired between the exodus and reaching Kadesh Barnea. Except the fact that the levees broke, faith gave way, and disaster fell on the people. But again, this isn't just a journey about them. It isn't just a history lesson for you. This is about your own journey. Does your faith ever stumble? Does your faith ever want to quit? It happens to us all, doesn't it? So when faith is most likely to struggle, when is faith most likely to struggle? We want to look at that. I want to give you three times today when faith, designed to protect you against the storm, actually begins to suffer a surge of unbelief. Are you with me? We're talking about times when my faith feels like giving way to a surge of unbelief. And I hope that you'll learn today through the message that though your faith may stumble, it need not crumble. Though your faith may stumble, it need not crumble. Number one, a time when your faith is likely to stumble or to give way is faith when it's in the crisis. At God's instruction, Moses sends out 12 spies. We read this in the opening verses of verse, uh, chapter 13. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of, of the, every tribe of the fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. So Moses does. He picks out 12 men, 12 men to represent each of the 12 tribes, and he sends them into the promised land. And after 40 days, they're supposed to come back and report about the people, the cities, the productivity of the land. And let's get to their report. It's in chapter 13, verses 27 through 29. We're looking at now chapter 13, verses 27 through 29 to see their report. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of the Jordan. Let's look at what they saw as they're reporting what they saw in the land. First of all, they said it was a fruitful land. A fruitful land here they identify as that which is um, a land flowing with milk and honey. Maybe you have pictures in your mind of a cereal commercial with water flowing down through a river and honeycomb uh, standing on the shore growing in the trees. That isn't what the, the phrase milk and honey means. Milk here probably has the idea of the milk that would be in mama and uh, sheep and goats because the grazing was so good they would give forth good milk for their kids. And then also that the, the honey here may not refer, probably doesn't refer to bee honey, but rather to the sweet uh, fruit of the date palm, which is common and native to Israel. And so, but the, the, it is speaking of the productivity and the, the bounty of the land. It'll support the sheep and the flocks that the Israel is bringing with them. And they have the sweet fruit of the land to enjoy. In fact, in previous verse, verse 26 talks, or 25 and 26 talks about the pole in which it took two men to carry a single cluster of grapes. Maybe you've heard about that. Some with uh, some grapes with clusters long, the kids' song goes. And it was a long, great cluster of grapes, so it was a fruitful land. But they sound a, a note of trepidation in verses 28 and 29 when they talk about the walled cities. They're great. They're fortified, and the children of Anak live there. Now, for most of us, that doesn't really say a whole lot. What does children of Anak mean? It refers to... A, a tribe or a group of people that were known for being large. So not just large cities, but the people who lived in them were large, maybe like giant people. And you know, we do encounter giants in the Old Testament, right? 
This isn't foreign to the 1 Samuel chapter 17. David faced Goliath and he was at least nine feet tall. Now we don't see people like that, not even the NBA, all right? <laughs> so these are giant kind of people. And so the, the report comes back. We see, we see great walled cities and we see great giant kind of people in there. In fact, they go on to say in another passage we're going to get to in a moment, we feel like grasshoppers in their sight. But, but Caleb, he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Look at verse number 30. He, he puts a little note of optimism in the passage. Caleb, he's one of the spies, along with Joshua, who bring a good report. They stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. So there's a voice of sanity here. Hey, we can still do this. Let's get on board. Let's rally the troops. Let's march in. Let's take the land that God has given to us. Boy, you need some optimistic people, don't you? Not just when you have an army, but when you have a church, like today. People with optimism that still can believe it can be done, even when everybody else says it can't be done. We need that kind of person, people in our church right now. You think you're going to build a church? Look at the economy. What are you thinking? The interest rates are going up and so are the prices. It ain't going to happen. And then you have a Caleb that says, oh, relax. Let's, let's believe God we are well able to overcome and do this thing. Not because we're great, because we've got a great God, but more on that later. Well, that's what they saw. They saw a fruitful land, but they sounded a note, an ominous note when they saw the fortified cities. But I want you to notice what they believed, because this is, all, this is even more important than what they saw. The ten spies object to the optimism of Caleb in verse 30. And in verses 31 to 33, they run the gamut of their true opinion about whether they can take the land. So this is ten out of the twelve spies say in verse number 31, But the men that went up with him, that's the other ten spies, we be not able to go up against his people. What did they say? This is our opinion. We be not able to go up against his people. Ain't going to happen for they are stronger than we are. In fact, they give three reasons. The first one is there in verse 31, which I just read. The people are stronger than we. Verse 32 says, The inhabitants of the land it eateth up the inhabitants thereof. It's almost like the, idea that the land is so hostile, you step in it, you're going to be in some enchanted forest. The lions are going to come out of the, the forest and eat you up. You don't want that happening, do you? All right, and then on top of that in verse 33, Again, they mention the giants there, the sons of Anak, which is that designation in the Old Testament for large people. There's no way we can do it. This idea of the, the word giants here in verse 33, the Hebrew probably has something, something akin to uh, our word today, which would be, um, the, they're, they're boogeymen up there. <laughs> they're, they're hobgoblins. They're going to get us. They're just going to come out of the woodwork and out of the enchanted forest and, and they're, they're going to set us on fire. This is Don't do this. And so we were in their own sight as grasshoppers in verse 33. We can't, you know, the bottom line here is we can't do it. Take it from us. Going there is a bad idea. Now what are the people going to do to this? Bad news. They're in a crisis. God led them to this land. And now, as far as the spies are concerned, the land stinks. Whose idea was this anyway? We can see the crisis that Israel is in in this text. But do we see that we often face the same crisis in our own life? In fact, I think we all face crises of faith more regularly than we would acknowledge. And when we face a crisis of faith, I want to go to the next screen because what you're going to do is you're going to have the same dilemma that Israel did. The Israel, what you see is the fruitful land. What we see are the giants in the land and the fortified city. And, and what faith has to do in the crisis is has to go with what God says over what I see. That is always the crisis of faith. Will I believe God or will I go with my gut and what I see? My gut says there's no way I'm taking that city. There is no way I'm going to be able to, to, to succeed at that job. There's no way I'm going to get through this problem with my teenager. That's what I see. 
but while I go with what God says. And God said, that's the land I'm giving to you. That's the land of your fathers. I promised it to Abraham. Wherever he put his foot down, that would be the land of he and his, his descendants. Will you believe what God says? This is always the crisis of faith between what we see and what we believe about God. This will always be a test, and it will be a test more regularly than you think. I believe that most Christians face tests of faith on a daily, if not a weekly basis. Opportunities where you're either going to trust God or go with your gut and what you see. And this is the challenge of faith. Let me give you some examples. Here's another bill I didn't expect, and there's no more money in the account to meet the bill. That is what I see. What will I believe about God? The company cuts my hours or cuts my pay. That's what I see. What will I believe about God at that time? Here's another example. Government passes a bad law, infringing on the rights of Christians to freely exercise their faith in some public way. That's what I see. What will I believe about God? Here's another example. Your child suffers an injury or a severe illness. That's what you see. What will you believe about God at the same time? Some of you may recall the Berge family. They're a missionary family to South Africa. Here's a picture of most of them. I think there are seven, eight, or nine kids. I, don't even, I haven't even counted but they've also they've set up an orphanage in South Africa called Little Fish Ministries, and they've been ministering there for about four years. I think it was four or five years ago we had them through our church, and some of you may recall. The parents' names are kind of, they're hidden in the back, Brent and Selena. Well, just this March, um, Nathan, who is the tallest boy to the, in the left of the picture, Nathaniel actually, He went into a hospital, had a bowel obstruction, and while he was in the hospital, they discovered an irregularity in his blood and said he had some kind of advanced uh, form of cancer. And so Selena and Nathaniel flew back in March, and he's been undergoing chemo treatments now for the last three months, and they just uh, wound up here, I believe it was the end of May or the early part of June, and so far he's doing okay. The cancer is clear Let me give you the name of the cancer. I think it's in my notes somewhere. So it is pediatric Burkitt lymphoma is what he's suffering with. And he's still not out of the woods. His immune system is quite weak. And uh, they expect him to be uh, laying low. And he has to go through a bunch of different specialists to check other, uh, other things out. But what a trial. They're serving God. They're not only doing this orphanage thing, they've got a church on the side uh, down in South Africa. They're busy for God. Their family is separated. In fact, I believe the rest of the family is due to come to the States uh, within the, uh, these, uh, this, these couple weeks here at the end of June and, uh, and get back together for a little bit before they return to the field in South Africa. What a severe illness. What a trying time for the family to be separated. And uh, we can thank the Lord that so far the scans and the medical reports are going well. But what do you do? That is what you see. God, I'm serving you and this is happening to my family. So what will you believe about God? That is the crisis of faith. Sadly, I think too many Christians just give up. You mean, I serve you, God, and this is what you're going to do to me? You know, I, I, I think I'm done with you. Now, none of you would say that, right? But you know people that would. If you were hoping for a fair-weathered faith, one which keeps you from all trouble, you got into the wrong religion. God does not keep us from the crisis. He walks with us through the crisis. And He makes sure you make it. I love this verse from the Psalms, Psalm 34 and verse 5. They looked unto him, David speaking, they looked unto him in faith and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. If you'll look to God in the midst of the crisis, 
He will keep you going and allow you to go through it and make it so that your faith, though it stumbles, it need not crumble. Number two, faith and a crisis, obvious, presented by the ten spies who brought the bad report. Number two, I want you to notice faith and complaints. How are the people going to respond to the crisis they're in? Would they trust God or give up? Let's find out. Verse number one, chapter number 14, we're picking up there. And the Bible says, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? Would God we had died in this wilderness? Wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children would be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain, let us return unto Egypt. And Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. Wow. Israel returns at this bad news to what they love most and did best, and that's complain. They attack Moses and Aaron. We see this in verse number 1 and 2. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. But of course, the main problem wasn't Moses and Aaron. Who had led them through the wilderness? Who had brought them to the very threshold of the promised land? God. Notice verse number 3. That's really where their complaint is. Wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Can I talk to you about your frustrations a little bit? You ever frustrated? When we're frustrated... We blame people for our frustrations. It's my boss. Man, that guy's got an attitude. It's our spouse. She isn't getting it. It's our kids. You just won't get in line. But back of most of those frustrations with people is a frustration with God who isn't doing as much as we think He should to smooth our way and make us feel happy. So when you complain, you put God on trial. Even if you're complaining against Moses and Aaron or some other person in your life, you're really putting God on trial and you're condemning Him for being a bad father. Because certainly you could do a better job than He's doing. we got to be careful what we think and we got to be careful with what we say. Jesus himself said, out of the abundance of the heart, should be coming up, Matthew chapter number 12, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Have you said things like this? All right, not you, but people you know. (laughs) Why did he bring me to this God-forsaken place? Why does he make me struggle with all these physical problems? Why can't he provide me a soulmate with whom to share my life? Why can't he give me a job I like? Oh friend, this is where faith struggles and sometimes stumbles. When we complain, our faith starts to give away. We've got to be careful that our stumble doesn't lead us to crumble under the weight of our problems. And gaining some control over our complaints will help us not to fall. So when frustration starts to build, let me give you some help. Let it move you toward God and not away from Him. Let it motivate you to get a hold upon the the horns of the altar like they said in the Old Testament. i got to get to God. Rather than griping about those who can do nothing, talk to the God who can do something. And then your faith will begin to regain its footing when I talk to God. And I'm not just making this up. This is David's psalm, a masculine of David. Psalm 142, he says, I cried to the Lord with my voice. You ever feel like doing that? I do. I talk to him that way. This is Mike, and I have a need, God, and I'm coming to you again. With my voice unto the Lord, I had made supplication. I poured out my complaint. 
if you must complain, talk to somebody who can do something about it. Make my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. You know, it is okay to complain before the Lord. This is not working. I don't like this. I want it to be different. God, I don't know what you're doing. Please help me in this. Help me. You know, sometimes you just have to pray. Lord, I don't know where it's going next week or next month. Just help me to make the next right step in my life. I don't know what to do with my kid or my job or my... Sp help me to make the next right step. That is a step of faith. You don't have to know everything that's going to happen down the road. You just have to make the next step. And faith helps you to keep your footing. And God will help you too if you complain to Him. Now there's a, a neat thing about this text. that I put it in this point. I didn't know where else to put it. But it comes in context right with these complaints. You know, and you'd think that God would be ready just to wipe these people out. Actually, He does almost get to that. Look with me at this. This is at verse number, um, verse number 11. Chapter 14, 11. The Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? How long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have shown them. Verse 12. I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. Now this happened back at the, the golden calf incident too. And it was really a test of Moses' faith and whether or not he trusts God to do what he said. And we dealt with that a bit there. But before God got to that, he actually shows grace. Do you hear that word? That's a great word for us, grace. I like grace. Grace is like get, getting what I don't deserve. And these people have already complained. They've already brought a bad report. They're already believing the ten spies, not the two that were good. And, and they don't want to take the land. And you know what? God could have just put them on the chopping block right away, but He doesn't. This to me is amazing. It's right in our text. Can you look at this with me? This is just fascinating. Verse 6. And Joshua, he's the other good spy with Caleb who brings a good report. He's the son of Nun. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. That's a sign of sadness. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it, it's an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delight in us, then He'll bring us into the land and give it to us, a land that, which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel ye not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land. You know what, he's, what God's doing here? He's giving the people a second chance. The ten spies say, don't go. That's bad news. Don't, don't go to that place. And here's two spies say, no, 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 no. Remember God? Hey, remember what's going on here? You can trust God. You can still take the land. So he's given them a second. Does God ever give you second chances? You ever falter in faith and I'm, I'm quit? And then he brings somebody to you. And he's bringing Joshua and Caleb to the people. And he's reminding them of a couple important things, lest they forget it in their decision making. Number one, the land is good. He says it in verse number seven. I think it's verse seven. Yeah, it's an exceedingly good land. And he goes on to identify it in verse number 8, a land which floweth with milk and honey, which we've already talked about. Hey, the land is good. Hey, and besides that, i got one better for you. The Lord is good. And he, look what he says in verse number 8. If the Lord delight in us, if the Lord looks favorably upon us, we can believe it. We're, we're going to take this land. They're going to be like bread for us. We're going to go in and eat them up. You know, it sounds like a cheer on a soccer field or a basketball <laughs> We're going to go in there and eat those cougars up. We're going to do it. Amen. And why was Joshua and Caleb speaking that way? Because they knew the Lord was good. Friend, don't you know the Lord is good? Don't you know if you trust Him, He'll come through for you? Hasn't He done it for you in the past? Can't you trust Him in the future? So when your faith is suffering under complaints, remember the goodness and grace of the Lord and trust Him to take care of you. And don't quit. How good and a gracious God we have. We've all been tempted to give up on faith. To think that God, to think when we, when we stumble in our faith or when we're ready to give up, some of us tend to think that God wants to give up on us. But this passage says anything but. He's still there and He's still willing to show you, give you the good land. He's still willing to be good to you if you would trust Him. So when we stumble... He comes alongside to help us back, not to push us down. God gave Israel another chance, and He does the same with us. And if you get nothing else out of the message today, this was my epiphany this week, that God gave Israel a second chance to reconsider their ways. Don't give up on faith. 
Believe God will take care of you. Trust Him and He'll come through for you. Are you even aware of the second chances He gives you? Some of us have blown it. That first marriage did not go the way we thought it was going to go. But He gave you a second chance. You blew it with your son or your daughter. You ran them away, but now they've called you back. God is giving you a second chance with them. God is a God of second chances. And He'll give you another chance too because He's good. So listen to Joshua and Caleb. The land is good and the Lord is good. And when your face stumbles... Because God is so good, it need not crumble. Finally, where did the time go? Somebody is winding up that clock and making it go faster. Third point, faith and consequences. Faith and consequences. If anything can motivate you to walk by faith, it's finding out what happens when you don't. <laughs> And this is in the text, and it's helpful for us because I don't want to make the same misstep that Israel did at Kadesh Barnea. I don't want to say I'm not going to go. I don't want to turn back when God wants me to move forward. Why? Because of the consequences that come because of unbelief. Hebrews chapter 3 says they could not enter because of unbelief. They lost something because of their unbelief. And friend, you always lose something when you don't walk by faith. Let me show you what they lost. Letter A, they lost the land. Moses did plead for them after God had determined to disinherit them. Again, we see Moses, the great intercessor that he was in verses 13 to 20, pleading with God to have mercy, and he does. But they still lost something that they would never regain. They lost the land. Look at this with me, verses 20 and following, chapter 14. I'm reading... Chapter 14, verse 20, The Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word, but as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land. Do you get that? Surely they shall not see the land, which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. They lost the land. They missed getting to see what God was. They didn't go to Disneyland. They didn't get to go. They forfeited the opportunity. He promised them a land. He safely brought them to the land. And then they refused it. So he took it away. And a whole generation... 40 years, a whole generation would not get to see the land. That's a huge loss. Now let me ask you a question about faith and consequences. Does that sound severe to you? Does your faith have a hard time dealing with a God who would send consequences for sin and wrongdoing? Maybe you think that God should just forgive and it should be all okay and that He should just make it all up and smooth it all out, you know, and, and make it well again. But we don't see that in the Bible. God does forgive, but there's still consequences. They weren't able to enter the land. They lost it. Some things we do in unbelief we can never regain. Did you get that? Some things you do in unbelief you cannot regain. You may not be... You know, that marriage is over. You're not going to go back and get another chance at it. The decision that you made to turn back from God and not go into ministry when you're a young person, that, you, that may not be possible to go back and undo that. God will forgive, and He'll bless you. He'll still be good to you, but you cannot rewind everything and make it perfect again. So let me encourage you, walk by faith now so you don't miss out on what He has for you. They lost also their lives. The failure to believe in God and move forward at Kadesh Barnea resulted in them being in the wilderness for 40 years. Look what happened to them. They all died. 20 years old and older. This is verses 28 and 29. Say unto them, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. 
Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Again, does that sound severe? Look back at verse number two. Why did God make them all die for this? Look at verse 2. I read it earlier, chapter 14, verse 2. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or, look at the last words, Would God we had died in this wilderness? When they complained, what did they ask for? We prefer dying in the wilderness to going into the land. How did God judge them? He gave them what they asked for. Ooh. Ouch. Okay, so you think dying in the wilderness is better than obeying my will? Okay, well, I'm turning you back into the wilderness and you will die there. God gave them what they asked for. His judgment was divinely poetic. They didn't die at the hands of the giants in the land, but they did die in the wilderness which they chose. Because they ran out of faith. Let's talk about this. I'm almost through. You guys doing good? Nobody's going to sleep on me, are they? All right. Just last week, a man from Huntington Beach, California named David, 67, was found dead in Death Valley National Park. Apparently, he had run out of gas while driving through the park. Not a good thing to do when you're what is it, a thousand feet below sea level in Death Valley? Extreme heat warnings, right? Caution, he's there in the middle of June. He ran out of gas and he did what uh, rangers tell people not to do. When you run out of gas, don't walk away from your car. Stay with your car. Somebody will find you. He wandered away about two and a half miles away from his car. He was found a couple days later by park visitors. He was about 30 feet off the main road behind a tree and a rock, and he had succumbed to the elements because he ran out of gas. A car doesn't go far with gas, and Christians can't make it far in the Christian life without faith. Faith is the air we breathe, and the moment we start a stop believing is the moment we stop living as a Christian. We must believe God. We must trust that what He says is true, and believe it applies to me. Must go with God or we won't go far as a Christian. So don't run out of faith. All right? When your faith starts to stumble, it need not crumble. No one is saying that walking by faith is easy. We all prefer walking by sight and not by faith, right? If I could see it, I can believe it. The real test is to believe believe it even though you can't see it. We all have struggles with faith. We all face time when we want to quit. And we see that vividly in the text. But when your faith starts to give way, I want to encourage you to reach out and grip the rope of faith and hang on and don't let go! And you'll find that God holds the rope more tightly than you do. At a fairgrounds in San Jose, California, Somewhere in the early part of the 20th century, 2,000 spectators were gathered together to watch a a balloon operated by a a man by the name of Professor Hoff. And when the balloon was filling with gas, he asked several of the standby uh, spectators standing by if they would help release the ropes at the moment he gave the signal so that the balloon could rise. One of those fellows was named Mikado. He got right up there, he waited, The balloon was ready to go. The professor gave the signal, let go. Everybody let go. Even Mikado left go and he began to step back. But when he stepped back, something about the ropes caught him and his foot went straight up in the air and he's dangling. And he reaches out with all of his gusto to grab the rope. And he's holding on for dear life. He calls up to the professor, professor, pull me up. Save me, save me. I'm going to fall. Professor tries to pull him up, and he doesn't have the strength to do it to get him up into the basket. And so about a half a mile later, he's releasing the gas, and the balloon is coming back down. 
And eventually Mikado safely puts his feet back on the ground after flying through the air for half a mile, almost upside down. I don't know what may be testing your faith today. You may feel as if your faith is dangling at the end of a rope. But let me encourage you, re-grip the rope of faith. Hold on to God. Don't let go. Father in heaven, help us to walk by